And um, this session today, we're going to do a couple of things with you guys. And um, the expected outcomes for today is you will understand the assigned team project teams and assessment criteria. You will understand and apply principles of teamwork and collaboration online. And you will understand and apply principles of drawing 3D objects in space, uh, which you will do a kind of a workshop to understand that uh, in music in 3D. So um, we are. Welcome to this presentation on teamwork and collaboration online. In today's presentation, we will give models for teamwork and collaboration for those forming, participating in, and leading teams. Participants will be able to diagnose where their teams are working well or need work. A team is two or more people working on a common objective. For example, look at the person sitting next to you. Siriam and Sahina are sitting next to each other. Now, imagine I have just assigned the two of you to work together to learn something new today before the end of this presentation. You are a team of two. Team Complexity is the number of person-to-person -person interactions within a team. For your two-person team, there's only one possible person-to-person -person interaction, so your team complexity is one. The more interactions that are possible, the more complex the team. For example, looking at the person sitting on the other side of you. So now we have Siriam, Sahin, and Sabrina. And they are added. For your three-person team, there are now three ways to interact, and your team complexity is three. Most of you have four people here today. That complexity is six. That's why you have a team leader and a communication coordinator. If you had seven or eight people, you'd have a complexity of 28. Sorry, that's the engineer in me. Teams can be one time or recurring. For example, when this presentation is over, your three person team project is over as well. So that's Sahin, Siriam, and Sabrina are off the hook. That's a one-time team. On the other hand, even when this presentation is over, the faculty team will be sponsoring more shared class presentations. Magwa, Ginger, Sidearm, Siriam, Roa, John. That is a recurring team. Teams that you sign up for are voluntary. Teams that you are assigned to are involuntary. For example, your UN goals for a sustainable world project is involuntary. The models that we will present apply to all of these types of teams. From an analytical point of view, a team may be considered as a box with arrows. The arrows on the left represent the inputs of the team, such as your team members and their skills and time. Siriam, let me take questions uh, later, if you don't mind. But that's a good question. Magwa, would you mind keeping a record of the questions that come up? 
All right. The arrow on the right represents the outputs of the team, such as your project presentations and displays. The arrow on the top represents the controls on the team, such as assignments and constraints. In this course, your controls include the team briefing and the project briefing. For example, you had an assignment today. That was a team briefing telling you what to do. The arrow on the bottom represents the supports of the team, such as things that help get the job done. In this course, your supports are the shared classes and the extended faculty. I'll just say it again. Every one of the 12 scheduled classes is designed to support you succeeding in the learning objectives, including having team leaders and communication coordinators to keep absentee members as best as possible updated on what happened when they weren't there. My job today is to empower you not only to be an input arrow, but to be a support arrow yourself. No matter what team you're on or what role you play on that team. Each of you bring an individual investment to the team box based on what you already know how to do and whether you are willing to do it. Together, these make up your net contribution to the team. Commitment is your level of dedication to the team objective. The simplest measure of commitment is showing up. It is what you do. Competence is your level of proficiency in the role you play to achieve the team objective. It is what you know. This is a simple model and it goes like this. High competence times high commitment equals high effectiveness. Low competence times low commitment is low. If either your commitment or your competence are zero, your effectiveness is zero. This depends on what team you're participating in. You could be zero on one team and medium on another and high on the third. Each team has its own metric. Most of the time, individuals achieve medium effectiveness due to constraints on their knowledge and time. Anything above zero is a win. The question is, for each team you are on, what do you know how to do, and are you willing to do it? Your team brings a group investment to project success based on how well your members cover as many as nine team roles. These roles include leading the team, idea generating, investigating other efforts, detailed specialist knowledge, steadfast implementing, filling in the gaps, ruthlessly tracking progress versus goal, fine detailing, and coordinating the team. This is a simple model and it goes like this. High coverage equals high success. Low coverage equals low success. Most of the time, groups achieve medium success due to one or more team members, one or more team roles, not being covered by a team member going in. However, anything above zero is a win. The question is, for each team you are on, what roles don't you know yet, and are you willing to learn them?
Best practices address how you and your group communicate. Brainstorming is an opening exercise where new ideas are generated. Deciding is a narrowing exercise where choices are made and action begins. Briefing is a narrowing exercise where agendas and ground rules are decided before an event begins. Debriefing is an opening exercise where members reflect on what happened at an event after it is over. This is a simple model and it goes like this. Either you talk to make things more open and expand the options, or you talk to make things more closed and narrow the options. The ability to expand options and the ability to narrow options are both needed. Throughout your project, your team will cycle back and forth between opening and closing communication modes. Both are essential to productive team operations. The question is, in the current conversation, are you in an opening or a closing mode? And is it time to switch? Stages address how you and your team evolve through time. Forming is where you learn each other's names and how to get in touch with each other. Storming is where you argue with each other about how to do stuff. Norming is where you get used to each other and agree on a plan and detailed action steps. Performing is where you crank out results. Throughout a project, your team will cycle back and forth between these stages. For example, adapting to changes in skills, circumstances, and team members. You will be adapting, improvising, and overcoming up to and even during your team presentation. The question is, for changes that arise, is it okay to proceed per plan or is it time to do something different? Right now, you are in a team project called Virtual World International Student Project. Even when this is over, you will certainly be in some other team project. In fact, you already are in other team projects, your family, your friends, your other activities, and work. Each time you participate in a team project, you have the opportunity to experience a growth cycle. You are listening to what is being asked, choosing how to participate, acting on your choices, advancing based on your results, and extending your personal abilities to make things happen. The question is, what are you willing to learn how to do next? These are extensions to teamwork theory. So please look at this uh, new placard that's over here that I'm waving in your face. Commitment and capability. I have said that the second C for individual best practices stands for competence, commitment and competence. But it would be better to say that the second C stands for capability. In other words, even if you do not have a skill, such as familiarity with second life, it may be within your reach, especially if you decide to learn it, as everybody here has. So capability can be acquired in the process of a team project. 
Requests and promises, introvert and extrovert. I have said that individual and team best practices are characterized by communication modes of brainstorming and deciding and briefing and debriefing. It would be better to also add the distinction of requests and promises. A request is a speech act of committed action. For example, I request of each and one every one of you here today. I request that you turn in your project exhibits by or before April 24th, 2024. Now you can accept this request, you can decline this request, or you can counter offer this request. But the fact remains that this request is now outstanding from me to you until completion or non-completion by the request date. A promise is also a speech act of committed action. For example, I promise each and every one of you, I promise that if you follow today's teamwork tips, you will be more effective in your work by or before April 24th, 2024. This promise is conditional on your accepting the first request. But the fact remains that this promise is now outstanding between me and you until completion or non-completion by the promise date. Introvert and extrovert, personal identity and public identity. Introvert and extrovert are labeled characteristics of personal social behavior as perceived by others. Both have value but fail if carried to extremes. If you prefer never to speak up, never to type in text chat, never to use your voice chat, you risk not getting what you want in life because you cannot get what you want if you do not ask for it. If you prefer never to shut up, you risk not getting what you want in life because you cannot find out what else is available in the world if you do not listen. Formulation, concentration, low momentum, high momentum, communication, fulfillment. I have said that team development stages are characterized as forming, storming, norming, and performing. Magua, could you mute your mic, please? You're thunder typing in my ear. It would be more precise to characterize stages as formulation, concentration, low and high momentum, communication, and fulfillment. Declarations and assertions. In formulation, you are making a declaration of intent. A declaration is a speech act of committed action. For example, I declare that my project will help improve the world by teaching practical examples of sustainable development goals. The validity of a declaration comes from the authority of the individual who makes the declaration. For example, I have the authority to say what my life will be dedicated to. In concentration, you are making your first promises and requests to each other on your team. For example, I request that you read the UN webpage on your assigned SDG before your next team meeting. You can accept this request, you can decline this request, you can counter offer this request, but the fact remains that this request is now between each team member and their other until completion or non-completion by the request date. Would you record that question for me, Magua? Thank you. In low momentum, you have made in low momentum, 
By now you have made and accepted and completed enough promises to make progress. Initial promises are small. May please we meet after today's class. As you develop interest and trust, the promises and results get bigger and bigger. Hey, you know what? I'll summarize quality education before our next team meeting. The bigger the promises that get completed are, the more you move into high momentum. Your project starts as pure nothingness but intent. The validity of your project rests on your authority and commitment as a team to take it on. I, the red team, take this on. I, the blue team, take this on. I, the green team, take this on. But your project becomes real through making and keeping requests and promises. You will have no evidence for the reality of your project until you have reached fulfillment. An assertion is also a speech act of commitment. For example, we assert that we have completed our SDG project exhibit on time. An assertion closes the loop. An assertion is a declaration that your intent has become reality. Benefit and cost. Finally, I have said that there is a benefit to increasing your individual and team effectiveness through application of teamwork theory. But it is important to add the warning that there is an initial cost of discomfort, frustration, embarrassment, confusion, and challenge in pushing beyond what you already know and you know how to do. This is a short overview and demonstration of what you will be creating here in Second Life. Everything in Second Life consists of objects located in a three-dimensional grid. Three-dimensional grid. I try to draw a three-dimensional grid there. I'm an en engineer. What can I say? Every object has properties such as shape, the size of this whiteboard in front of you, uh, size, how big it is, location, what's in front of you. But our avatars are also objects in this space. Look around you. Each one of you is an animated object in space. We express our ideas outside the constraints of drawing on two-dimensional paper or having to buy and build with real materials in the physical world. Complex creations are made from combinations of primitive shapes, such as cubes, cylinders, and spheres. We call this modeling with objects. If you look to your left, you'll see some plywood cubes and spheres, and then some weird twisted shapes. Modeling with objects. It can be as simple as squishing a cube to make it into a carpet. There's a carpet on the ground next to you, next to the purple flag stretching a cylinder to make it into a flagpole, like the flag has. Default shapes appear with a surface texture that looks like brown plywood. We can change that color. We can change that texture. There are built-in images such as metal, water, or sand. We can upload our own images from our camera, apps, or the web, we can make a magic carpet. There's a magic carpet next to the blue, I mean, the, the purple flag. We can make a world globe that's on the other side of the purple flag. And we can make an art gallery of our work. Now, over to the right, you'll see a picture of a, well, it's a duck, okay. But I took that picture near where I live. So you can have your own art gallery. We can take a static object and add motion and animation by adding simple scripts such as object rotate and texture slide. 
If you look to your right, you'll see a rotating searchlight next to the duck. And next to it is a miniature lighthouse on top of a simple ocean. If, and you can see the blue waves are sliding across the ocean. Those are using simple scripts that you can use yourself. Each object can have special additional properties, such as flexibility and softness for a flag, glow for a spotlight, or light for a local light in addition to the virtual sun. The purple flag, for example, is gently waving. If you click and look at it, it's gently waving. It's soft and flexible. We can model with the environment itself. Everything is inside of a 3D grid here. We can change the location of the virtual sun over our head from midday to morning or to midnight, or depending on where you're visiting, it may automatically cycle through the day. We can change the virtual wind blowing on that flag and make it stiff as a board or soft as noodles. And it can change the gravity affecting it. And finally, we can model with sound. We do this by adding simple scripts such as play sound and using built-in sounds or uploading our own. And that was going to lead us to our demonstration. But before that, let's do a quick sound check. I'm going to click a gong and ask you guys if you hear a gong sound. If you... Good. Okay, everybody. Everything that's orange, you can click. This exhibit is about music in 3D. You can read the placards and click. Let me suggest that one team, one group come over here. In fact, I'll come over here for a second. You'll see that there's a moving, waving object. Uh, I don't know what to call it. Pink noodles and blue beads. This was an animated expression of the concept of multiple dimensions and multiple variables. And then over here, these are musical expressions of soft, loud, slow, fast, plain, fancy, and two time, three time, which are musical dimensions. Yep. Then over here, there you go, good. You can stay there. If you, somebody wants to see another demo, let's walk over here. Some of you can stay wherever you want. This is an interactive uh, game. Um, the first one is match the sound to a word. So K-L-M-N-O. There you go. So the, quest, the, the quiz is, does that sound sweet, oily, savory, salty, or sour? Yeah. And the game is what? letter goes with salty what letter goes with sour good and then some of you are playing the story game so we have one two three four five six seven which one of these sounds like running which one of these sounds like bashing yep yep so those are these are musical or sound expressions of story concepts or in this case of taste concept. There you go. Then it gets a little more interesting over here. This game is called, uh, well, I call it the timbre keyboard, but there are three parts. So if you click brass synthesizer at the top and then voice and then piano, you can actually play it. Everything is around. There you go. And each line of three is a separate theme. And I like to call this teamwork in action. This is a musical expression of teamwork. There you go. 
So we're going to take just a few more minutes to, to explore some of these. Go to outside URLs. Mago really loves the one on uh, all the noise. This one here. Do you every noise at once? He found. Uh, he went to that external website and found uh, game music. Game music is a genre of music, and if you go to that website, it'll have multiple thousands of music samples that you can listen to on your own. I see some of you are doing the frequency spectrogram. This is what sound looks like. This is a visual expression of sound. Clarinet, piano, trumpet, and the voices. There you go. That's what your voice looks like. The red is the loudest part. And there's another external web link here that uh, you can go to called uh, Spectrogram Chrome Music Lab. This will take you to a web page and you can play the flute or you can use your microphone and see your own voice in action, which is how I recorded those over there. Okay. So the evaluation criteria are five of them. Authenticity. Accuracy of content, balanced sites without bias, accessible aesthetic appeal, interaction and or immersion, and the presentation itself. So those are the five criteria that your work will be assessed on. For students, 70% of the total grade will be given over the final project. You'll be working in assigned groups, teams, pay attention to evaluation criteria, participation is always important, and the rest is up to you. You learn and you have fun in this course. That is the goal. And when we look at the criteria once again, authenticity and accuracy, what, what does that mean? What do they ask us? They have more explanation here, the Virtual World Education Consortium. So I'm going to read some of those just to give you some more tips. But then we have our own course syllabuses that you can, uh, we, we will hand it out and also you can reach on the website. Uh, you, you have more detailed information there as well. Uh, authenticity and accuracy should be ap apparent in your build and presentation. Where did your information come from? Citations or so resources listed. Examples include accurate historical content of a particular era, authentic clothing and objects from, from the time, and accurate scientific language and concepts demonstrated with sources documented. Balanced without bias means you have shown both sides of any concept or argument, if applicable. Examples should, would be showing both sides of a political issue, such as fracking or climate change. Interaction and or immersion means your audience can do something, click and interact with the objects rather than just view slides. Like what you have you have seen an example of that right on the music uh, exhibition that site show you were able to go there you were you were able to interact with that field so that is what is expected from you as well to create more interaction with a 3d immersive uh, layout on your build accessibility and aesthetic appeal 
show that you have considered people with hearing loss or low vision in your build or presentation. A well-designed build considers the colors and textures. Examples, eye-pleasing tones and no spinning neon signs. Points to cover are example from Gentle Heron's checklist. Gentle Heron was the presenter, by the way, last Saturday. So that is, she is basically working for a, a I mean, founder of an organization here, Virtual Ability Island, and that island is basically trying to help the disabled people to integrate to virtual world. So that is what she is expert of and has been doing. That is her list. Are there clear instructions for what you see and where to go? Is interactivity clear to the viewer? Are objects clearly labeled? Is it easy to move around? No difficulties, stairways and so on. Is signage easy to read? with rotating particles. No, so the checklist is meant to provide awareness of potential for embedding accessibility and not expected to be fully adapted by student builds. And the presentation includes how you explain your content to your audience. The presentation should show the subject matter clearly using both voice and text. A good pacing of information enhances the build. 